In March of 2015, 22-year-old Sailor Gilliams and her good friend Brendan Vega, who was also 22, decided they wanted to go hiking. Now, they were both highly inexperienced hikers, so when they were looking in the area for places to go hiking, they were looking for novice trails, things that they would be able to manage, and they thought they had found one in Santa Barbara, California. And so they headed off in that direction, and they took off on this particular trail a little ways into their hike and they started to feel like, man, the terrain here is pretty treacherous. This is way more difficult than we were expecting when we looked at the map. And as they continued and they're climbing over these huge boulders and it just seems totally like an advanced trail, they start to wonder, you know, did we veer off the trail? Worried they might be lost, they turned around and began backtracking, hoping to find the trail and find some landmark that would allow them to confirm they were on the right trail. As they're backtracking, not only do they not find the trail, but they don't find any trail. They've managed to go completely off the path and are now in this kind of random boulder field that they have no idea where it is on the map. Navigating this terrain in the daytime with light would have been difficult even for an experienced hiker. But now it's nighttime, they don't have flashlights, and they're jumping boulder to boulder and Sailor at some point loses her footing and falls and fractures her leg. Brendan rushes over and tries to help Sailor stand up, but she can't move. And so Brendan tries to put her on his shoulders and starts walking with her. And that works for a little while until they're passing by this waterfall and they fall off of it and they come careening down, they smash onto the ground, they survive the fall, but Brendan now has a broken elbow and Sailor now has a broken ankle on top of her broken leg. Sailor's in excruciating pain and because of this fall, there's just no way Brandon's gonna be able to lift her back up and keep walking. And so the decision was made that Brendan was gonna go try to find help on his own and that she would stay here and continue to yell for help in hopes that someone might hear her before Brendan got back. He takes off and as soon as he's around the corner and gone, Sailor begins screaming for help. And she would continue screaming for help all through the night well into the next day. About 24 hours after Brendan had left, he still had not returned. And at this point, Sailor's in and out of consciousness. She knows that she's going downhill quickly unless someone finds her. By the following afternoon, Brendan is still not back yet. So laying face down in the mud with flies buzzing all over her head, she was helpless and trapped and there was nothing she could do but wait until either a miracle occurred and someone found her or most likely she just dies. So at the same time that Sailor and Brendan are going through this horrible ordeal, three totally unconnected people decide they wanna blow off work and school and just go escape into nature. And so they settle on a hike that would bring them to a waterfall in Santa Barbara, California. Even though this waterfall was a popular tourist attraction, it was very difficult to get to it. It basically required 45 minutes of almost uphill climbing across boulder fields. Very dangerous, and it's not something for a novice hiker to be doing. So they reach the parking lot, they take off on this hike, and when they're just at the base of the waterfall, instead of taking the main trail up to the top, the three hikers decide, let's actually go around off the trail to this pocket of boulders over here where there's a couple freshwater pools that have formed underneath the base of the waterfall. So they leave the main trail and they're climbing over these huge boulders. It's very dangerous. And at some point, one of the hikers starts taking pictures as they're kind of going across these boulders. Through the viewfinder, as they're taking pictures, they notice something out of the corner of their eye that's in frame. It was like this red flash of something. And so the hiker puts their camera down and she looks down where she sees this red and she can tell right away that it's someone's hair. It's a girl's dyed red hair. And it was Sailor. The hikers went down to Sailor and they called 911 and they came in, they airlifted her out of there and Sailor would actually make a full recovery. Unfortunately, Sailor's friend, Brendan, did not make it. They found his body about 100 meters away from where she had been laying. After the ordeal, the woman who was taking those pictures and had spotted Sailor out of the corner of her eye, she went to her camera and was flicking through some of the pictures she had taken during the hike. She had inadvertently taken a picture of Sailor before they had found her. So had it not been for these hikers being where they were and taking those pictures and noticing her red hair, this picture almost certainly would have become the last picture of Sailor Gilliams alive.
Jolie Callen was this little four foot 10, 18 year old girl from Alabama who, despite her tiny stature, had a huge personality and was incredibly popular. Everybody seemed to love this girl. In 2015, Jolie had just graduated high school and was planning to move away from her town and go to college outside of Alabama. And she was really excited about it. But she had a bit of a problem because she had this boyfriend named Lauren Brunner, who she had repeatedly tried to end the relationship with because he was so possessive, but she hadn't been able to successfully break up with him yet. Every time she tried to, he would threaten that he was going to hurt himself or that he was going to hurt her if she ever left him. And so she never quite followed through. But with college on the horizon and to her what felt like this fresh start when she left Alabama, she finally pulled the plug on her relationship with Lauren and made it very clear that they are done. And she was firm on that decision even when Lauren did start lashing out and yelling at her and pleading with her and doing everything he could to win back her affection, but it just wasn't gonna work because she had moved on. For weeks, Lauren was trying to convince Jolie to change her mind, but again, Jolie just stayed firm on her decision. And after quite some time, it seemed like Lauren had finally got the message because his messages and cries for her to change her mind had stopped and there was finally a little bit of distance between the two of them. On August 29th, 2015, Lauren would break that silence and would reach out to Jolie and ask her if she wanted to go for a hike with him, simply as friends. Jolie was naturally hesitant about this, worrying that you know this hike as friends could very very quickly turn into something more that she didn't want, but she did want to remain friends with Lauren. He was very important to her. And so she reluctantly agrees to go on this hike. After Jolie responded to Lauren that she was willing to go, Lauren was really excited. And so he posted on Instagram this picture of himself looking, I guess, excited. It's hard to tell from the image, but the caption basically said that he was excited about going on this hike with her and that things were, quote, looking up. At the same time, after Jolie had given that answer to Lauren, after she had agreed, yes, I'll go hiking with you, she texted her friend jokingly, if something happens to me, you'll know who I was with. The next day on August 30th, Lauren picks up Jolie and he begins documenting their trip on his Instagram page. Jolie gets in the car and he takes a picture of her and he captions it on our way to go hiking. The second image that he uploads is of Jolie walking her dog Kiba in a parking lot. It appears that this lot is at the base of the hike they're about to go on. The third image shows Jolie standing on a rock overlooking this forest and she's holding her dog Kiba. And it's clear based on this picture that now they've actually begun the ascent up this trail. The fourth and final picture that was uploaded to his Instagram page shows Jolie standing on a rocky cliff and she's holding her own camera up and she's taking pictures out over this valley. And the picture was captioned, Jolie the photographer. Immediately after this picture was taken, Lauren would shoot Jolie twice and push her off of that cliff. He was sentenced to 52 years in jail and bragged to the inmates he was with that if he couldn't have her, no one could. In November of 1961, a wealthy doctor named Arthur Duperalt chartered a luxury yacht called the Bluebell to take he and his family from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to the Bahamas. Along with his family, which was Gene, his wife, his oldest son, Brian, who was 14, Terry Joe, who was 11, and Renee, who was seven, Arthur also brought along Julian Harvey, who was a close friend of his, that he had hired to be the captain of the ship. And Julian was gonna bring along his wife, who was named Mary Dean. And so on November 8th, 1961, the Duperalts and the Harveys set sail on the Bluebell, and by all accounts, their trip was going extremely well. But on the fifth night of the cruise, Terry Jo was down in the sleeping quarters of the Bluebell when she woke up to the sound of stamping sounds and screaming coming from above. She was so scared about what could be going on up there that at first she didn't do anything. But eventually she summoned the courage, got out of her bunk, and she kind of slowly made her way up the stairs and poked her head out onto the deck. And immediately she sees that her family is lying on the ground. They're all deceased. As Terry Jo is frozen in terror, Julie and Harvey comes running up to her and tells her to go back down into the sleeping quarters. And so not knowing any better, she just turns around and runs back down to her bunk. But as she's sitting there, she sees that water is flooding into the bluebell. She can't stay down here or she's gonna drown. So Terry Jo goes back up the steps. She goes onto the main deck and she sees Julie and Harvey who's standing over the edge of the boat. And she yells to him and says, are we sinking? And he looks at her and he just says, yes. 
and then he promptly jumps over the railing and swims to the lifeboat that had detached from the bluebell and was drifting away. He climbs onto it and takes off, abandoning her on the sinking ship. Unbeknownst to Terry Joe was the reason the Bluebell was sinking in the first place was because of Julian Harvey. When he was hired to be the captain of the ship, he used this as an opportunity to bring his new wife out with him and then kill her and collect on her insurance policy. Because in her life insurance policy, there was a clause where he would get double the amount of money if she died in the case of a freak accident. But it's speculated that while he was attacking her, one of the Duperalts had seen him doing it, and so in order to cover his tracks, he had turned on the Duperalt family. And so while it's not entirely clear why he didn't just finish the job with Terry Joe, it seems like when he jumped over the railing and took off with the lifeboat, he must have assumed that Terry Joe was going to sink with the rest of the family, and then there would be no more evidence, no more witnesses. So 11-year-old Terry Joe, as she's standing on this sinking ship, she snaps into action. She remembers seeing a cork float that was pinned up against one of the walls of the ship. And she runs over and she undoes it. She puts it on the water. She climbs on top of it just as the bluebell sinks under the surface of the water and disappears. And so now she's just stranded out in the middle of the ocean. She's got no food, no water, no shelter from the sun on this little dinky cork float. Over the next couple of days, as she drifted along aimlessly in the ocean, her cork float would begin to disintegrate and she would have to start positioning her body on the float so there wasn't much weight on it because it was basically beginning to sink and the only position she could find that worked was by dangling her feet in the water so she's half on this cork float half of her body is in the water and so what began happening is parrotfish began swimming up and biting her toes her feet and her legs but she couldn't do anything about it she couldn't put her legs on the cork board or it would sink after two days of balancing precariously on this cork float the parrotfish disappeared and a bunch of dolphins surrounded her. And later she would go on to say that this was the only part of this horrible ordeal where she felt some sort of comfort. These dolphins just swam around her and almost formed a protective barrier around her that kept the parrotfish away and kept other predators away from her. On November 16th, 1961, 84 hours after the bluebell had sunk, a Greek freighter actually spotted Terry Joe. Amidst all the whitecaps, they were able to see this little girl on on a float and they drove over and there she was. And initially when they went down to try to get her, there was so many sharks swimming around her that they had to be very careful that they didn't accidentally knock her into the water where she might be eaten by sharks. But eventually they were able to get Terry Jo into their basket and pulled her up onto the ship and she would make a full recovery. As for Julian Harvey, he had made it back to shore and had told authorities that the Bluebell had caught on fire and that everyone had drowned except for him. You know, he had done his best to save them, but he was the only one who could get out. And as luck would have it, he was literally in a police station giving information about what happened when the police were informed that Terry Joe had survived. And the police, they turned to Julian and they say, Terry Joe survived. She's in the hospital. She's going to make a recovery. And Julian was said to have gone totally ashen in the face and then kind of composed himself and said, why, that's wonderful. Julian quickly excused himself and fled to a Miami hotel, and the next day he was found dead in his hotel room. This is the picture of Terry Joe that was taken by one of the Greek sailors right when they pulled up alongside her before they pulled her onto their ship. This image would soon appear in publications all over the world. Despite Terry Joe's horrifying ordeal, she would go on to live a very normal life and would have six children of her own. Soon after the Beatles dissolved in 1969, one of the four members, John Lennon, left his native England and moved to New York City. Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, took up residence in the Dakota, which is a very famous building that typically houses the rich and famous people of New York. As soon as Lennon moved to New York, he said that he felt relieved because he didn't have to worry about going outside and getting mobbed by a massive crowd of people that were obsessed with the Beatles. There were people that were huge Beatles fans in New York, but they seemed more respectful and they would ask for his autograph, but they would mostly leave him alone. Mark David Chapman had always been a massive fan of the Beatles with a particular interest in John Lennon. But after a 1966 interview where John Lennon kind of off the cuff said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus, this soured Chapman's adoration of Lennon. One of Chapman's high school friends recalls around this time frame Chapman rewriting the song Imagine by John Lennon to read Imagine If John Lennon Was Dead. 
Chapman started referring to Lenin as a poser and said that he espoused virtues and ideals that he himself did not practice. And so in relative short order, following that 1966 interview, Chapman went from this adoring fan of the Beatles and John Lennon to really solely hating John Lennon and everything he stood for. By 1980, it's safe to say Mark Chapman had become obsessed with John Lennon. Specifically, he had become obsessed with hating John Lennon. In October of 1980, Chapman quits his job as a security guard and flies to New York City. For two months, he stayed in the city and didn't really do much of anything. He would just periodically walk past the Dakota where John Lennon supposedly was living, but beyond that, he really didn't do anything in the city. But that would all change on December 8th, 1980. On that day, Chapman went to the Dakota and he stood right outside the entrance to this building and just waited in hopes that he might run into John Lennon. At 5 p.m. that day, John Lennon comes out with his wife, Yoko Ono, and they walk right past Mark Chapman, who flags them down, and he asks John if he can have his autograph. And John Lennon, even though he has a limousine waiting for him and there's people that are starting to notice that, oh, that's John Lennon, people are coming over, John still took the time to sign an autograph for Mark Chapman. He was very friendly with Mark and asked him if this is enough, do you want anything else? And Mark said, no, that's it, that's fine. And John Lennon said, okay, take care. And John and his wife, Yoko Ono, turned and went into the limousine and they drove away. When the couple got back to the Dakota that night, Mark Chapman had not left. John Lennon and Yoko Ono get out of their vehicle and they walk past Mark Chapman, who's standing right outside the front door. It's unclear if Mark and John had any interaction, but as soon as they passed Mark, and were making their way into the building, Mark Chapman drew a gun and shot John Lennon four times in the back. And John Lennon staggers into the lobby screaming, I'm shot, I'm shot, before collapsing and dying. And Mark Chapman, he knew what he was doing, he just stood there, put the gun back in his pocket and just waited to be arrested. Chapman's lawyers wanted him to plead insanity, but he refused and instead said, I was totally sane, I knew what I was doing, I chose to shoot John Lennon, and I plead guilty. And he was given 20 years to life in jail. And while he was in jail, he would admit that the only reason he did that was to become famous. That was it. This is the picture of Mark Chapman getting that autograph from John Lennon in front of the Dakota just hours before he would gun him down. He's still in jail today, and he actually just had his 11th parole hearing last month in August of 2020, and it was denied. On July 17, 2014, people at Amsterdam's bustling international airport began boarding Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 that was bound for Kuala Lumpur. The 283 passengers on board were from all over the world. Some were traveling for vacation, some were going home, others were just traveling for business. In addition to the 283 passengers, there were also 15 crew members that rounded out the flight to a total of 298 people on board MH17. One of the passengers, before walking down the runway to get on the flight, took a picture of the plane itself and uploaded it to Facebook and kind of jokingly captioned it, if we go missing, this is what it looks like, in reference to another Malaysian Airlines flight, Flight 370, that had actually gone missing just a couple of months earlier. Once the boarding was complete on MH17, one of the passengers on board uploaded to Instagram a short video of passengers stuffing their luggage into bins and the captain coming over the intercom saying that, you know, boarding is complete and it's time to turn off your cell phones as we prepare for takeoff. A 15-year-old Dutch boy named Gary Slock and his mother Petra had just sat down inside the plane and they could barely contain their excitement. The pair had signed up for what they were calling a vacation of a lifetime with a group that took single parents and their children on these lavish vacations. Gary, who was the goalkeeper for a soccer team, had been telling his family how jealous his teammates were of this trip he was about to go on with his mother. Before Gary turned off his phone, as instructed by the captain, he took a selfie of he and his mom grinning ear to ear, excited about their trip, and he uploaded it to Facebook for his friends and family to see. Gary turns off his cell phone, puts it away, and he and his mom sit back and get ready for takeoff. The plane takes off without a hitch. It gets up to cruising altitude. And you know, it's gonna be a long flight. It's about 12 hours from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. And so everybody on board's kind of settling in. They're getting their iPads out. They're getting a book out maybe. The crew is making their rounds, offering snacks and drinks. And you know, people are looking out the window. It's a beautiful day. And everyone's just kind of settling in for a long flight. About three hours after takeoff, around 4 p.m., the captain of MH17 got in touch with air traffic control at the nearby airport, which was in Ukraine. 
The pilot told controllers that everything was fine. He was flight level 33,000 feet. The controllers acknowledged that and said, hey, there's a little bit of air traffic in the direction you're going. You need to reroute your course very slightly. The pilot acknowledged this change in course and was beginning to tell them what he was going to do next when he cut out. The controllers on the ground in Ukraine began hailing MH17 to try to get the captain back online. They couldn't reach him. The plane had sent no distress signals, and over the course of their communication, the controllers had not noticed anything abnormal. And so this sudden radio silence really didn't make any sense. Yelena Brichenko was a 20-year-old bank teller living in Ukraine who happened to be looking up right as MH17 was flying overhead. She would later say that what she saw would haunt her for the rest of her life. As she was watching, MH17 just explodes and the people inside of the plane very clearly get ejected out of the plane. And she's watching as these people and bits of plane are falling from 33,000 feet and they come crashing down in this huge fiery inferno. The theory backed by US intelligence was that pro-Russian separatists could have fired a missile at this plane thinking it was Ukrainian military. It was not, it was just civilians. All 298 people on board MH17 perished, including Gary and Petra. This is the selfie that Gary took moments before takeoff with his mother as they were excited about their vacation. Family and friends that saw this picture on Facebook would say that this image perfectly captures Gary's wonderful personality and the love that Gary and Petra had for each other. From the outside, Bart Whitaker appeared to love his family. He and his younger brother Kevin were extremely close, and Bart and his father shared a passion for long-distance cycling and would often go out and bike around the neighborhood together. Bart's family would regularly go on vacation to places like Cancun, and the pictures of Bart with his family on these vacations are always him beaming with happiness and love for his family. On December 10th, 2003, Bart, who was 23, almost 24 years old at the time, made a special announcement to his family. He told his family that he had just finished taking his final exams of his senior year at nearby Sam Houston State College and that he was gonna graduate. Bart was not a natural student and frankly struggled in college. And so this was a really big announcement and the family was really excited for him, especially his parents. And so they said, we have to go out and celebrate. And so they went out to a restaurant and they're having this really exciting expensive, lavish dinner, and in fact, his parents had bought a really nice Rolex watch to give to Bart if he were to graduate college. And so here he is announcing it, and they thought, you know what, now's a good time to give it to him. They give him his Rolex, and they're asking people at nearby tables to take their pictures, and everybody just seems so happy, and the parents are so proud of Bart. After they finish dinner, they're all smiles, they pile back in the family car, and they start making their drive back to Sugarland, Texas, where the Whitaker residence was. It was inside of this upper-class suburb about 40 minutes away from Houston, Texas. On the drive home, his parents are endlessly talking about how proud they are of Bart and how excited they are for his future. They get back to their house, they pull in the driveway, and Bart's brother and parents make their way up to the front door. Bart is behind them and he says, hey, I forgot something in the car. He turns around and goes back to the car as his brother and his parents walk into the house and are immediately gunned down by an assassin waiting inside of the Whitaker residence. Bart hears the shooting and runs back inside the house. He sees his family is down. He ends up wrestling with the shooter who ends up shooting him but hits him in the arm before escaping the house. A neighbor hears the shooting and runs outside and sees this chaotic scene. They call 911. Police show up and Bart's brother, Kevin, has passed away as well as his mother. They both died on scene. As for Bart and Bart's father, they would go to the hospital and they would both make a full recovery. So this huge investigation is launched to figure out who this assassin was and why he was attacking the Whitaker family. And quickly they discovered that Bart Whitaker had hired him. Bart Whitaker wanted his family killed so he could take their money. And he had had the assassin shoot him in the arm to make it look like, you know, this was not his fault and he wasn't involved. Here's a picture from the night they were out celebrating Bart's big accomplishment that he had finished his final exams, except Bart was a total liar and he had stopped going to classes ages ago. He was failing every class and was not even close to graduating. In this picture, Bart knows that the assassin he hired is currently sitting in their house, waiting for them to return when he is gonna open fire and kill Bart's family. The people in this picture with him are going to be murdered literally hours later and he knows it. Bart was convicted in 2007 for hiring the hitman and was given the death penalty, but 
40 minutes before his execution, the governor of Texas commuted his sentence to a life sentence because oddly enough, Bart's own father, one of the people he tried to have killed, had forgiven him and did not want to see his last remaining family member be executed. In 2014, a 20-year-old man living in India named Maksud Khan had become completely and totally obsessed with tigers. His wife and his family weren't entirely sure what caused him to be so fixated on tigers, but they noticed after a kind of random trip to the zoo that he took, that he came home and all he could talk about were tigers. So they figured he must have seen tigers at the zoo and just become totally enamored with them. But Maksud's obsession with tigers was not just, you know, love and affection for these animals, although certainly there was that. It was more of a dark fascination with tiger's savage nature. The story Maksud used to tell all the time to his friends and family was about this tiger that was in captivity and one day its two trainers had gone into the cage to put a garland of flowers around its neck for maybe some ceremony or something and the tiger just wasn't having it that day and when they went to put it on its neck the tiger kind of snapped and killed the two trainers. Now, Maksud was not telling the story to kind of glorify the violence of it, or even to act like it wasn't a big deal that these trainers had been killed. He was telling the story with a reverence for these creatures that were kind of untamable, that even in captivity, they were in control, and he was just totally fascinated by them. In May of that year, Maksud lost his job, something that unfortunately happened all the time for him because he was known to be kind of lazy and kind of happy-go-lucky he didn't take things very seriously. He had actually been fired from a job one time when he was supposed to be unloading sacks from a truck and got distracted by some small animal and ran after it and his employer fired him for it. But his family depended on him and they said, Maksud, you gotta go out and get another job. And so during the day, Maksud would go out and tell his family, I'm going out job hunting. But what he was really doing is spending the little money his family had to go to the zoo to go look at these tigers that he was so in love with. So for the next four months, Maksud would just lie to his family and would go to the zoo and stare at the tigers in their exhibit. And so one day when he was doing just that on September 23rd, 2014, he was looking into the white tiger exhibit. Now the way it was set up is there was an outer fence that all of the people who were at the zoo could stand right against. And it was an open air exhibit right on the other side of that fence all the way around was a little bit of land that protruded into the exhibit a little ways and then it would drop straight down into a moat that was another layer of protection between the tigers and people so they were not interacting if you continued straight past the moat it would go back up again to this little island right in the middle of this exhibit where all the tigers would spend all their time for some reason that we don't fully understand although one could guess that it was simply because maksud wanted a better look at the tigers he climbed over that first fence the one that no visitors are allowed to cross and he walked to the edge of that piece of land that sits over that moat and he's looking down at the tigers and the guards are telling him to go back get back on the other side of the fence all of the other people that are there watching the tigers as well the other visitors they're saying hey come back don't do what you're doing and at some point maksud fell 15 feet into the tiger enclosure immediately an alarm goes off waking up the tigers in their habitat so they don't know what's going on they're kind of looking around and the people that are watching this happen from the safety of behind this fence they're screaming and yelling and they're trying to get security to come over and they're trying to save this guy it's just chaos but what's really happening is they're totally inciting the tigers to see what the heck's going on and very quickly one of the tigers notices that there is now a person maksud who's in the moat and the tiger jumps down into the moat and walks right over to maksud and maksud is sitting there and he's absolutely terrified and people said that he was just praying and he's huddled up against the side of the moat and the tiger's just looking at him the tiger's not showing signs that it's going to harm maksud but the people that were watching this happen that are on the other side of this fence are either taking videos and pictures of the event or some of them begin picking up rocks and throwing them at the tiger to try to, I guess, get the tiger to leave Maksud alone. 10 minutes goes by of people throwing rocks at this tiger and the tiger gets really upset. And so what do you think happens once the tiger gets upset? It attacks Maksud. The tiger clamped down on Maksud's neck and dragged him over to a grassy kind of hidden section within the enclosure. And by the time the staff finally showed up with a tranquilizer gun, it was too late for Maksud, he was already dead. 
Here is the final picture of Maksud after he's fallen inside of that moat. This is taken moments before this tiger would ultimately attack and kill him. The police would ultimately charge the zoo staff with death by negligence for their incredibly long response time and for not having any alternative rescue methods in place. John and Jackie Nill were a Canadian married couple that loved traveling to Thailand. In fact, they went there so often and loved it so much that they considered it their second home. In 2004, instead of spending Christmas with their family back home in Canada, they decided, you know what, we're empty nesters, we're on our own, let's go spend Christmas in a place that we love that's also warm, Thailand. And so they settled on one of their favorite spots in Thailand called Khao Lak. It's this beautiful beach town. They'd been there many times and so they were pumped. On Christmas Day, they called their family and said they're having such a great time. The weather is beautiful. They have this wonderful beach right in front of them. And by all accounts, their vacation seemed to be going really perfectly. On December 26th, the day after Christmas, the couple woke up and decided to head down to the beach to spend the day lounging on the sand. But as soon as they stepped out of their villa and looked down at the beach, which was right outside of where they were staying, they saw this huge crowd of people standing on the sand. And even though it was early in the morning, John and Jackie knew immediately why they were down there. It was an extremely low tide. The water had receded so far that it was a spectacle. And so they had their digital camera with them and they just started taking pictures. What John and Jackie and the people down on the beach seem not to have realized is that that extreme low tide is actually an early indication of a tsunami tidal wave where the water basically gets sucked way out in preparation for a massive wave. What John and Jackie and everybody down on that beach should have been doing that morning is turning around and running inland as far as they possibly can go and as high as they possibly can go. But they don't do that. In fact, it looks like no one has any idea what's about to happen. And so John and Jackie continue to take pictures and you see this massive wave coming closer and closer with every picture they're taking until it wipes out everybody down on the beach and eventually wipes out John and Jackie. They would be swept away to their death along with 230,000 other people. John and Jackie's camera would be found on the beach a month later. The camera itself was destroyed, but the SIM card was intact. And the person who found it would take that SIM card, plug it into their computer, and here are the final pictures that were on that bunkers, which is a term given to people who explore underground caves. In November of 2009, 26-year-old John was back home in Utah celebrating Thanksgiving with his family. During his visit, someone in his family suggested they go cave exploring like old times as a way to kind of reconnect. And so John, along with his younger brother, Josh, who was 23 at the time, and nine other friends and family got together and headed off to Nutty Putty Cave, which was a very popular spelunking location in their area that no one in his family had actually explored. On November 24, 2009, around 8 p.m., John and his brother, along with the rest of their friends and family, enter Nutty Putty Cave, and they make their way to the section called the Big Slide. It was not particularly challenging, and John, even though he had not been cave exploring in a really long time felt like he could do something more difficult. So he and his brother decide to split off from the main group and make their way over to the most challenging section of the cave known as the birth canal. So John and Josh start making their way over towards that section of the cave. They have a map and they're kind of trying to follow as best as they can. And John, who was leading the pair, stops when he gets to this waist high hole in the wall that he believes is the entrance to the birth canal. When John was growing up and he used to go cave exploring with his family, he was much smaller. He was a kid. Now he's a grown man. He's six foot over 200 pounds, but he still had the mindset of when he was a kid. And so like a child, he sees this hole and literally goes head first into it without any second thoughts. So John begins painstakingly inching his way down this tunnel that's completely tight on his body. His arms are pinned under his body and with every movement he's making, he's getting tighter and tighter, but he's convinced that this is the birth canal and that it just takes certain people that are brave enough to push past that discomfort, that claustrophobia, that if you just push past this tight section, you'll get to a place where it opens up. So John, believing this is the birth canal, kept going farther and farther into this tunnel until he's completely wedged. He has a little bit of tunnel still in front of him that actually kind of bends down in front of him. And he thinks, man, that's it. I just gotta go all the way down there and I can get into that opening. 
And so he's caught up against a lip of rock that's underneath his ribs. And so in order to get past it, he breathes all of the air out of his lungs and he pushes himself just past the lip. And then he breathes in again, and his chest expands, and his rib cage is literally caught up on that lip because he's now moved past it. He can't bring himself back over the lip. And what's worse is as soon as he got over that little lip, he got a better view into this hole he was going down, and it dead ends. It just gets to a point. There was nothing there. It was not the birth canal. It was an unmarked tunnel somewhere in this cave. So he's trapped, and he knows it. And to make matters even worse, John was almost completely upside down. John yells to his brother and says he's stuck. Josh starts going down this tunnel and he almost immediately gets stuck. And from where he is, he can barely see his brother who's way down this tiny little tunnel. And he knows that if he's stuck up here, his brother's really stuck. This is a very, very bad situation they're in. So Josh barely gets himself out of this tunnel and he yells to John that he's gonna go get help. But it would take three and a half hours for the first rescue worker to arrive on scene because they are way down into this cave. This is not an easy to access area. Susie Matola was the first rescue person and when she arrived, she said, hey John, how you doing down there? And Susie would say that John sounded very distant and he just said, hi Susie, thanks for coming, but I really, really want to get out. Susie immediately reassured John that she will have him out in no time, everything's gonna be just fine. But when Susie looked down into this tiny little space that John was stuck in, she thought this is gonna take a really long time to get him out. I mean, just to set up a pulley system to try to pull him out is gonna take a long time. And then inching a six foot, 200 pound man out of this tiny space, that's gonna take hours and maybe even days. But unfortunately, John didn't have the time. The human body is designed to be upright with gravity helping your heart pump blood to the rest of your body. When you're inverted, blood pools in your brain and your heart cannot work fast or hard enough to get it out in time. And so it eventually causes your body to shut down. So when the trauma physician saw that John was inverted and he had already been there for three and a half hours before rescuers even got to him, he told Susie and the rest of the rescuers that John maybe has eight to 10 hours left to live. The rescuers tried everything to try to get John out of the cave. They put a rope around his legs and tried yanking him out, didn't work. They set up an elaborate pulley system. It barely worked, but they kept falling out of the wall. And so it was taking all this time just to get set up only to move him a fraction of an inch. They got drilled and chisels and they went down into the tunnel and began trying to chisel John out. But again, it was almost negligible progress and it was just taking too much time. As the rescuers are doing everything they can to try to get him out, they noticed that John's breathing was becoming labored and his voice sounded nasally, indicating that more and more fluid was building up now inside of his lungs and that probably they were within the last few hours that he was gonna be alive. At some point, they finally got John to move just a couple of inches using this really elaborate pulley system that they had found a way to stay anchored in the walls, but they saw there was a huge problem. No matter what system they were gonna use to get John out of this hole, due to the angle of the cave he had crawled into, his legs would not fit. They would not bend in the right direction on the way out. They would have to break his legs in order to curve him around this bend in the cave. With John's breathing already labored and him being basically unresponsive at this point, they figured that if they broke his legs, that would just send him into shock and kill him anyways. And so they realized that they cannot get John out of this cave. He's going to die here. 27 hours after John had become stuck, he became unresponsive and he was declared dead. The 26 year old medical student would leave behind his wife as well as their one year old daughter and his wife was due with their second child in June of the following year. Following John's death, Nutty Putty Cave was sealed off with cement and John's body is still inside Nutty Putty Cave to this day. And here is a picture of John exploring Nutty Putty Cave before he ultimately made his way over to that fateful tunnel that he went in headfirst and ultimately died inside of. So that's going to